Before we begin, I would like to invite you to join us for the Frick's first ever virtual gala, Frick on the Move, which will take place on Monday, October 19. As part of the evening's festivities, I will be hosting a special new episode of Cocktails with a Curator. I hope you will all attend, and to learn more about the event, please click the link in the pinned comment below. Good evening, I am Xavier Salomon, the Deputy Director and Peter J. Sharp Chief Curator at the Frick Collection in New York. Welcome to this episode of Cocktails with a Curator. When we think of the Frick, we always think, of course, of European art from about 1200 to 1900, which is the scope of the collection as we know it. But there are some exceptions in the collection, and we do have a few objects that were created outside of Europe. In particular, this evening, I would like to talk about these two carpets which are the only two objects in the entire collection that were made in India. And these are in themselves extraordinary and very important objects. Carpets, of course, were hugely expensive objects to produce, especially of this quality. Uh, these were created in the early 17th century, uh, the one on the left probably in the 1630s, the one on the right in the 1650s in Northern India. They're made out of silk and pashmina wool, which is the typical wool that comes from uh, goats in the Himalayas in Tibet um, that was used to make especially famous Kashmir shawls. And uh, the, this wool was also used in India to create these kind of carpets, which were then dyed with a number of uh, vegetable and animal dyes, in particular the very recognizable dark, beautiful red, uh, which was made out of lac. I am particularly fond of these two objects because when I first came to the Frick as uh, an Andrew W. Mellon Curatorial Fellow in 2004, one of the first projects I worked on was this exhibition, Gardens of Eternal, Eternal Spring. Uh, which was about these two carpets, which had just been restored uh, between 2001 and 2005 at the Metropolitan Museum across uh, Fifth Avenue by the renowned textile conservator Nobuko Kajitani. And I was given this project to, uh, to spearhead as a young fellow. And so this was really my beginning as a curator, is one of the very first exhibitions I helped curating. Uh, here is a younger version of myself with uh, Susan Galassi, our former senior curator at the Frick, as we are supervising the installation of the carpets in the Oval Room. And here I am with the team of uh, people who were really responsible for this wonderful installation. Uh, the restorer in the middle, Nobuko Kajitani, and on the left, uh, Stephen Saitas, who was the designer of the exhibition. Uh, in fact, Stephen has been the designer of uh, most exhibitions at the Frick, at least every single exhibition since I have been at the Frick in 2004 to today. So all the beautiful designs you would have seen of every exhibition at the Frick collection in the last 15 years and more uh, are the fruit of Stephen's work. And um, we're currently working with the rest of the curatorial team with Stephen again over the installation at Frick Madison in the Breuer building. And we're obviously having a lot of fun with that. To pair the carpets, I chose uh, a slightly Indian flavored cocktail. This is a chai martini. It's made out with uh, iced chai latte, so iced chai tea with milk and vodka. And I would like to raise a glass and dedicate this episode to Stephen in memory of this exhibition 15 years ago. The carpets were then displayed in 2006 uh, in the Oval Room. But these were carpets that were designed and used all the way until that date on a floor. And this is one of the reasons why, except from experts in carpets and rugs and, and, and a few people who know more about the history of these objects, usually carpets are dismissed as objects of everyday use. And in fact, both of these objects were bought by Henry Clay Frick as objects for everyday use. And it was really only in 
the early 2000s with the restoration project and then this display that people realize how important these carpets are and how they are works of art in themselves and how they deserve to be displayed as a painting, as a great masterpiece. Both carpets were acquired by Frick in uh, early 1918, by March of 1918, he owned them. The one on the left, with uh, a series of decorations of trees, was destined for the enamels room. And it was on the floor of the enamels room uh, through most of the 20th century. The one on the right, uh, with a floral pattern, uh, the slightly later one of the two, instead was destined for the library. And Frick had acquired a whole number of carpets, but most of them for the decoration of the house were Persian. And in the 19th and early 20th century, when people thought of the great carpets of the world, people thought of Persian carpets. Carpets, of course, were made uh, all over the Eastern world, the continent of Asia, from Turkey to Persia, at this point, of course, to India, to China. But Persian carpets, especially of this type from the 16th century, were considered in the 19th century and 20th century in America and in the Western world among the most important. This is a Herat carpet, but Frick bought a number of other carpets from both northern and southern Persia, uh, most of them of designs usually associated with the area around Isfahan. And some of these carpets are still on the floor at the Frick. Some of them... And of course, they're now protected by barriers, but some of them are so fragile and so precious that we now have to, unfortunately, keep them in storage and can only be displayed occasionally. They're very light sensitive, and of course, uh, they can only be displayed uh, on a wall rather than on the floor. So Frick buys these two carpets from the dealer Duveen. And in fact, they don't come as single works of art. They come as part of a much larger group of objects that Frick is acquiring, furniture, porcelain, carpets, that he's buying to decorate the house at 170th Street. We're about uh, a year, a couple of years uh, before Frick's death in 1919, at the end of 1919. And, um, and these were sold by Duveen. And Duveen had them, at least this carpet, in stock for quite a while, for several years before he sold it. And they, he actually sold them at a slight loss. But this doesn't mean that these were cheap uh, material and cheap objects. Uh, when we think about how much Frick bought them for, uh, this one was more than $30,000, about $35,000. Uh, the other one was $19,000. He actually paid more for these two, two carpets than he did around the same time for the Manet and the Renoir in the collection. So these were always identified and always considered luxury goods. They were created in India as luxury goods, and they were always uh, sold and acquired as such. This carpet is decorated with a series of depictions of trees um, along, on top of this wonderful red background. And the trees are not all identifiable, but of course we can see the cypresses at the bottom. And some of the other trees are peach-like or plum-like trees. And there are these very peculiar fantasy trees that were created in, in carpets in India, were depicted in carpets in India, which have leaves that are similar to sycamore leaves, but the flowers look like lilies. And these, of course, are not real plants that exist, uh, but they were often depicted on Mughal carpets. And here you see another detail with one of those trees, more or less in the middle, the cypress is at the bottom, and here you see also the beautiful border with these floral uh, decorations. The second carpet instead is decorated primarily with flowers, and there are a number of flowers, lily-like, carnations, uh, different types of flowers, more or less uh, naturalistically depicted. And you have the flowers in the central field against the red, and then the flowers around the border uh, against the blue. When the carpets came to the Frick, they were associated with these two other carpets. And in fact, um, one of the carpets was originally described as a Persian carpet, and the other one was described as Indo-Persian. And their provenance uh, wasn't exactly uh, well-defined. But they were associated with these two carpets that are still to this day known as the Ardabil carpets. These were originally two identical carpets that were made in Persia for the shrine of um, one of the rulers of Persia, of Sheikh Safi ad-Din 
in the town of Ardabil. Later on, this, this shrine by Europeans was misunderstood as a mosque, and so often these objects are described as coming from the mosque of Ardabil. But in fact, this was a, a Sufi shrine. And these two large carpets, identical carpets, uh, were woven in Persia in the 16th century for the shrine. They reached Europe, at least in the, the end of the 19th century, and after a number of restorations, which um, made it so that one carpet um, retained its larger scale because actually pieces of the minor carpet, the smaller carpet, were used to restore the larger one. And this was sold uh, at the end of the 19th century, the one on the left, to the Victoria and Albert Museum in London with the idea that it was this unique, very important Persian carpet. Only later, the same dealer um, sold the second one to a number of collectors and eventually the one on the right ended up at LACMA in Los Angeles. So they're both very important. We have to imagine there would have been identical carpets to begin with, but these belonged to the same dealer who owned the Frick tree carpet. And so the idea that the Frick tree carpet also came from Ardabil um, reached the scholarship in the early 20th century and this carpet until very recently, until new research that was carried out in the early 2000s, uh, was believed to come from Ardabil. So it was also known as the Ardabil carpet. And the idea was that it may have been a gift from one of the Mughal rulers of India to a Persian ruler, and that's how it had ended up in Ardabil. You can see from this photograph that this carpet is actually made out of fragments. And so the legend also came about that time that this carpet was considered a sacred object in this mosque and pilgrims would steal parts of the carpet and that's why the carpet was in pieces. In fact, we now know this is not true at all. Uh, the confusion with Ardabil is simply due to the fact that the two Ardabil carpets uh, were described in the same volume as this carpet, but there was no mention in the late 19th century that this also came from Ardabil, so we don't know that. Um, this is clearly not a Persian rug. It was made in India. And the fact that it is in fragments is due to the wear and tear of the past 400 years rather than any pilgrims or religious, uh, religious reasons. This was a very different carpet to begin with. And um, by looking at it carefully in the early 2000s, uh, the conservators and curators at the time and the experts in, in Indian carpets worked out that in fact, this is a puzzle. It's a finished almost carpet made out of many, many fragments that came from a much larger carpet. And on the left, you see this wonderful map that was reconstructed at the time, which shows you more or less where all the various fragments of this carpet, plus a few other fragments that survive in a number of public and private collections that came from the same rug, um, where they came from, from the original carpet. And this is what the original carpet in a digital reconstruction on the left would have looked like. So very long and narrow carpet, much, much larger than the already very large carpet that we have at the Frick. Uh, but we have to understand both of these, the floral carpet comes from a very similar uh, context, would have been much larger, much grander objects, which later in the 19th century in Europe, were restored, effectively reconstructed in what now look like Finnish objects, but they're produced with fragments of a much larger and more important whole. The carpets are known as Mughal carpets because these sort of carpets were produced during the Mughal uh, Empire in India, especially in the 16th and 17th century. The Mughal emperors arrived in India in the 1520s. Uh, Babur was the first uh, of the Mughal rulers of India, of the Indian subcontinent, which included areas of India, but also of what we today know as Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. And uh, the, many of these rulers were great patrons of the arts, like Akbar and, uh, and his successors. They were of... Turkish Mongolian origins, they're descendants of Timur, the great ruler of Central Asia. But of course, they were also often intermarried with other dynasties from Asia. So they were also partly Persian and they intermarried, of course, with uh, local Indian families as well, ruling families. Uh, the Mughal em emperors uh, ruled in name, uh, India, all the way to the 1850s. Of course, by that point, the power shift had changed quite dramatically. And of course, England was effectively ruling the country, but there was still a Mughal emperor in Delhi all the way to the 1850s. These two carpets at the Frick were produced 
around 1630, 1650. And these are both probably produced during the reign of Shah Jahan, who was the emperor uh, exactly at that point from the late 1620s to the late 1650s. Here you see Shah Jahan on the left in a Mughal miniature, uh, showing him uh, as the emperor uh, of the Indian subcontinent. And on the right, I just put it um, out of interest for us, but uh, this is a drawing of Shah Jahan by Rembrandt. And of course, Rembrandt never went to India, never met Shah Jahan, but Rembrandt was particularly fond of Mughal miniatures. And he did a series of copies of Mughal uh, miniatures. This is one of them. So he happened to own or, or see a, a miniature of Shah Jahan and he copied it. And this is Rembrandt's drawing now in the Lucht uh, collection at the Fondation Custodia in Paris. Uh, there was a wonderful exhibition a few years ago at the Getty Museum on uh, Rembrandt's drawings after Mughal miniatures. Of course, Shah Jahan is one of the great emperors of Mughal India, one of the great patrons of the arts. He is, of course, remembered by all of us as the builder of the Taj Mahal in Agra. But it is very likely that carpets like the two at the Frick were produced for the royal family, for the imperial family. Carpets of this kind, of this size, of these materials, again, I remind you, these are made out of silk and very precious wool, pashmina wool, would have only been produced by the state manufactories that worked for the imperial family. So we don't know if these were made specifically for Shah Jahan or if they were made uh, for another member of the royal family. We don't know if they were made for a palace, a fort, uh, or for a religious site. Um, and we don't know how effectively both of those carpet reached in reached um, the United States and, and Europe before that. Um, they could have remained in India until the 19th century, and maybe they reached um, London and Paris, where they first documented uh, directly from India. The carpet on the right belonged uh, to Maurice de Rothschild in, in Paris before Duveen bought it. Uh, the one on the left instead belonged to an English collector. It is also likely that maybe they did come from Persia, and it is possible that when Nadir Shah, the Persian ruler, sacked and conquered Delhi in 1739, he could have uh, brought these as war loot to Persia. And so maybe the, the link with Ardabil and the Ardabil carpets is that these were also acquired in Persia. But we don't really know. So it's equally possible that their provenance is from Persia, as they could have been in India from when they were created all the way till the 19th century. So the history of these two objects really before the end of the 19th century is still shrouded in, in mystery. We don't know exactly who they were made for and where they came from, but we do know that they were made for one of the rulers of India or someone very close to the ruler in his family. Uh, so the objects are now, as I mentioned, framed and displayed for conservation reasons in these uh, cases, vertically rather than on the floor. They're very large in size, and you can see them here in the oval room uh, next to our uh, Angre as they were displayed in 2006. In fact, between the early 2000s and today, they were only displayed in the oval room twice. There are issues with uh, light uh, sensitivity. So these are objects that cannot be displayed in, in light places for a very long time. And so um, we display them on, on occasional uh, terms whenever, whenever we can. But you can also see how large they are here in the oval room. And if you imagine that these are fragments of carpets that would have been four or five times the size in terms of length, you can understand really how grandiose and unbelievable these objects are. I'm talking to you about them because uh, one of the decisions uh, is to display the carpets at Frick Madison. So when we open there early next year, uh, these carpets will have a space dedicated to them and you'll be able to see them uh, as you haven't for many years now. So I hope that this will give people an opportunity to think about the richness of the holdings at the Frick. Uh, the wealth of materials. Uh, over these cocktails and travels, we've talked about paintings and sculpture and furniture and porcelain. But carpets are also part of the story and very important and beautiful objects. And I hope you will all be able to come and see them and um, look at all the details, the wonderful uh, details of the plants and the flowers. And even though many of the trees, for example, on the tree carpet appear similar, you realize as you look closely that they're all 
absolutely different. And you have to imagine the team of people who worked on the looms to create these absolute masterpieces. And to me, these are as, as important, uh, if not more, than many of our paintings in the collection. Overall, we know that carpets of this quality were produced in the Mughal Empire for about 200 years, but only about 500 of them survive, and most of them are still in India. So it is really wonderful for us to be able to display them and show something to do with Indian culture, in Indian heritage, Indian art at the Frick Collection uh, for, for the public who comes and visits us. Thank you for joining me this evening, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Good evening.